to Peace, Love, Liberty Radio, online at fppradio.com. And this is hour number two, which means it's interview hour. My guest this week, and if you were listening last hour, I spoke a good deal about the guest, Lynn Ulbrich, who is the mother of Ross Ulbrich. Ross Ulbrich is a 30-year-old young man who is accused of being the dread pirate Robert, the man allegedly behind the Silk Road. Lynn, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, I'm a pleasure to be here. So, it was great meeting you in Porkfest. Oh, it, it was a pleasure meeting you as well as your assistant, Isabel. And I yeah, still, I cannot right wait to see all of the photos that you guys were taking where yes, you had we're the... Getting, we're going to put up a Facebook photo album, but things have been so wild and crazy <laughs> since uh, Porkfest, but we are going to do that. That is definitely on our list. Yeah, so for the listeners who are curious what photos I'm talking about, you were going around, you had free Ross posters that had a QR code, and I believe that QR code was for the Bitcoin address where uh, people could make the donations. We had one for that, and we had one that goes to a landing page where you can also donate by PayPal or crowdfunding. And, uh, yeah, there's a great one of you. I need to send that to you soon. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to see that one, and I don't recall if I got a photo with you. Or not. Uh, I don't think so. So uh, we, we'll we will to... need to remedy that at yes. some point <laughs> because I, I know that, you know, at some point in the future, we will wind up seeing one another. I hope so. So yes. for the people who are not completely familiar with either you or Ross, and I know I gave a brief introduction about, you know, why you're important here. Uh, can you sort of introduce yourself for my audience? Sure. Um, I um, basically my definition these days is I'm Ross's mother, <laughs> <laughs> and his, and really his uh, main uh, spokesperson and fundraiser. Um, and I'm doing this because I believe that Ross is, is being um, accused of things he didn't do, and that the way things are being conducted isn't right, and um, that not only is this um, bad for us as a family and for Ross, but for the way that things are going, I think it indicates very tr troubling um, ways that the government is proceeding, and um, I find it somewhat um, disturbing and think it's, uh, it's relevant to everyone. Yeah, um, I, I don't see anything good coming out of this for anyone if the government does wind up convincing the judge that is being paid for by the government yeah. that Ross Ulbrich is some kind of criminal. I would argue that if he is the man that they say he is, that I think he's a hero because he has made, or whoever whoever created the Silk Road made the black market safer. There have been studies that have come out showing that the Silk Road and other online marketplaces like it have actually caused a reduction in violence associated with buying and selling illicit substances. So I, I'm not sure what your position is on the drug war, and I don't really know if that's something that you're interested in necessarily talking about, but... You know, if the government does wind up getting a conviction, then I don't see that as being good for anyone, especially you, because I, I cannot imagine the stress that you have been under since Ross was arrested. Well, yeah, it's been fairly uh, intense, um, although I do think it's an important mission on my part, and I'm just taking it day by day and trying to step up and speak up for him and and also uh i'm really trying to act as a um i might even say translator for our lawyer who's excellent and has made very good points but sometimes it's hard to kind of read through all that legalese and so i've i have a journalism background and i um have been summarizing what he says and trying to put it in a way that people can see 
what uh, the government's doing. There's also, and he's approved those summaries, and they're on our website, freeross.org. Um, the other thing that I have observed up close and personal is um, some of the obstruction or apparent obstruction uh, of what's going on with Ross in terms of, well, for instance, he was supposed to have access to discovery and evidence uh, so that he could participate in his own defense. That was, I heard the judge with my own ears in the beginning of February say that that's what she wanted. Five months later, he still didn't have access to it. Now, apparently, he, from what I understand, he does. So unless a guard that day doesn't feel like giving it to him. It's a bit arbitrary, but we're working on it. But and there's a ton of, of evidence, you know, and anyway. I, I so think that's you been had, a problem. You had mentioned something at Porkfest about he wasn't being given access to the discovery against him. And then when they ultimately did wind up sending him the information, they sent it electronically or on some sort of you know flash drive, but he obviously does not have a computer in his cell to use in order to you know look at this information. So how is he able to see this information electronically? Well, what what they did was they submitted CDs, but then he did, they didn't give him a computer with the software that could read the CDs. So that was a that we had to go back to court about that. And um, then now they have provided him a laptop um, during certain hours. Um, and like I say, there have been incidences where, well, they weren't, they just decided arbitrarily he couldn't do it that day. So there's certain uh, obstacles that we're working with the prison. And, you know, it's just a, a struggle. It's, um, it's a problem. But now it seems to be better five months plus later. And his trial is November third, so you know it's a it's a big delay. His a lot of information. His trial is in November, and Ian Freeman from Free Talk Live had asked if Ross was going to be able to get a jury trial, and that's not something that I I don't know if he is able to request that, and if he is able, I don't know if he has. But I figured that you would probably know the answer to that question. Well, as far as I know, there it's going to be a jury trial. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. I believe it is planning. They're planning to have it be a jury trial. I, I, to my mind, it's, it's going to be a little bit difficult to find. This is just me personally, to find a jury of his peers, considering how, you know, almost esoteric the information is when you consider the general population and how much they know about Bitcoin and Tor and that sort of thing. Right, but I, I've paid attention to trials long enough to know that jury of your peers doesn't actually yeah. mean jury of your peers. It just means jury of people living within a geographic yes. area that may or may not even be anywhere near where it was that you were living at the time of your arrest. So Ross, for example, was living in California when he was he arrested. Was in San Francisco. San Francisco. And mm -hmm. the trial is happening in New York. Yep. So are they finding jurors from New York? Are they going to fly jurors out <laughs> from San Francisco? You know, how, how do you define peers? And if it's finding people in New York City, well, arguably none of those people are his peers. Yeah, I, I mean, yes, I, I don't, I doubt they're flying people from California, and um, right, and I, most people I talk to have no idea what Bitcoin is, or a lot of people don't. I mean, to and to understand the complexity of this case, I think will be very challenging. Right, and finding people who are familiar with Bitcoin but have never heard, heard. of <laughs> Silk Road or Ross Ulbrich is going to be very difficult. That's because really you, know, you, you do need people that are familiar with the terminologies so that they can understand the complexities here. But I, I think it's going to be very difficult to find an unbiased jury. More when we come back.
Welcome back to Peace, Love, Liberty Radio online at fppradio.com. My guest this hour is Lynn Ulbrich. Lynn is the mother of Ross Ulbrich, the alleged Dread Pirate Roberts, who is the alleged creator of the Silk Road Marketplace, which is a website on what they call the Dark Net. It's on the Tor Network, Tor being the Onion Router. So it's not something that your average computer user is going to be able to access without special softwares being downloaded onto their computer. And Lynn, you were telling me about how difficult it's going to be to actually find a jury of peers who understand the technology being used and the terminology that is going to be used, thus making it incredibly difficult to actually wind up getting a fair trial. And there was news that came out in about the middle of last week to where I think the latest news is going to make it even more difficult for Ross to wind up getting a fair trial. The news that I'm talking about, obviously, is the update from the judge on the motions filed a couple of months ago by Ross's attorney it revol- or involving some motions to dismiss charges, specifically the money laundering charge, because the IRS has said that Bitcoin is property, not money. The FinCEN, which is the Financial Services Crime Enforcement Network, they have said that Bitcoin is kind of money and requires a money services business license to wind up transmitting if you wish to you know, buy and sell Bitcoin for other than personal use. You need a special license from FinCEN. And the judge said, well, neither the IRS nor FinCEN can regulate the definition of money for the purposes of money laundering. And besides, Bitcoin is close enough to money, so the money laundering charge can go forward. So what are your, I I want your thoughts on the motion by the judge involving the money laundering decision. Okay, well. I had understood that FinCEN said that virtual currency doesn't have legal legal tender status in any jurisdiction. Correct. Okay. Okay. I I thought it was completely saying it wasn't money. But anyway, well, let me just say um, that what the judge did, and, you know, of course, I wish she had just accepted all the motions and thrown the case out. That would have been great. But that the chances of that happening in a federal case, in pretrial motions, in a high profile case like this is pretty much, it's a pretty big long shot. It wasn't, I don't think that, you know, it's something you can expect. Um, And all she's really saying in this is not, it's not a comment or opinion on Ross's guilt or innocence at all. All she's saying is that the indictments are um, strong enough or um, that she thinks they are worth um, being brought to, brought to trial and to be and being reviewed in court but she makes many many points throughout those 51 pages that the government has a lot of proving to do and 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 the whether or not they can do that to prove anything is not a question at this stage that's not what she's addressing at all so hopefully it would not affect whether or not his trial was that trial was fair it's really just saying okay we're going to address all of of these counts in court, not now. And, you know, when you think about it, it would have been pretty amazing if she had accepted the motions. Certainly. Which- and I have not read the entire 51 page order from the judge. So I was not aware that the judge actually said, you know, the government is going to need to do a lot of proving here. And One thing that needs to be pointed out and I don't think can be stressed enough is that in criminal trials such as this, the proof 
needed to find someone guilty is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And when you're talking about anonymizing software that is being used, it is really hard to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. One could, you know, arguably prove clear and convincing that Ross was the Dread Pirate Roberts. And I'm not saying he was. I'm not saying he wasn't. I'm just saying there's enough circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial evidence is not good enough for proving beyond a reasonable doubt because that winds up giving that amount of doubt needed to dismiss or find someone not guilty of a charge. Well, and actually, we don't know what evidence they actually have. All I know is what I've read in the media and what the, the media says the government has said and what the government itself has said in their papers. That's the only quote-unquote evidence that I really know. Um, uh, Ross is just only now looking at what they say is evidence. Right. Just and to make that clear, um, circumstantial evidence, well, we don't really know. But um, certainly nothing has been... You know, so it's not actually evidence, I don't think, but uh, at this stage. But um, you're right. Uh, the standard at trial, which is evidence beyond a reasonable doubt, is much greater or higher standard than an indictment, which can actually is a fairly low standard. It's uh, our, my attorney said it it's, can even be based on hearsay. An indictment is very very easy to um, you know bring forth to someone. Right and. Yeah. It's also, I am glad you mentioned that all all that we know, we being me, you, and the other people that are not the lawyers or the government officials involved in the case, all we know is what we have heard or read in the media or what we have heard from other people who have read something in the media. So when I mention the evidence... Obviously, I'm mentioning things that I've read in newspapers of, well, the government says this. And to me, it, it is all circumstantial evidence. So mm -hmm. I, I think that, right. you know, as long as the jury is clearly instructed on beyond a reasonable doubt, then mm -hmm. I think it is very good that Ross will wind up walking a free man. Well, I, I hope that hope he so. does. <laughs> Me too. For his sake and for yours. Yeah, and for all of ours, really. Because, you know, we want to have a fair trial. And the way things are going, um, yeah, like you're saying, there's uh, the way it's being conducted, I'm concerned. Right. And, and then I, I, you, yeah, you've go got the media who is, you know, parroting the mm -hmm. claim by the federal government that was thrown out to the media initially right after Ross's right. arrest, but he was never charged with the supposed murder for hire, and there's not enough time this segment, but I do want you to address that to you know the best ability that you have when we come back about some of the allegations that have gone forth to the media but are not actually charges against Ross Ulbricht. Stay tuned. More on Peace, Love, Liberty Radio. Lynn Ulbricht is my guest. And Lynn, during the last segment, I teased the question that we did not have time for the answer for. I want to get your thoughts on some of the claims that the government made, or at least some government officials somewhere made to the media involving Ross, but they wound up never actually filing a charge on. Has that wound up hurting the fundraising abilities? Had, well, what's been the reaction to people when they say, oh, Ross, didn't he do a murder for hire? And then you have to debunk that. So, you know, just talk about the claims without a charge for a moment, if you can. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, originally in the complaint, they allegated six murder for hire charges. And then two and a half months later in New York at his arraignment, they didn't they did not indict him for five of them. 
One remains in Maryland. It's been there since October. Um, it's just sitting there. The whole case is being tried in New York, so I'm not sure what's going on with that. But um, it's now these murder for hire. They used them to deny him bail, claiming he was a dangerous person, which is a joke. Ross is the most uh, peaceful. I mean, his whole life is a testament to that, how nonviolent he is. But um, they used it to deny him bail and then did not indict him for it. And where it exists is in a mention. It's called it in the indictment under narcotics trafficking. It's called it an uncharged crime. It does not require proof, which is very convenient, even though it's an extremely serious charge. I'm not sure why it wouldn't require proof and why it wouldn't be charged if they had evidence. But in any case, yes, it has been very, you know, it's smeared his reputation I mean, many people think oh that's what they think of him as as some kind of thug and um gosh if you knew ross it, it's just such a ridiculous uh image you know he's so he's, uh, if i had anyway. to take a guess real quick of why they don't need evidence is because they haven't charged him with it so you know since it is an uncharged crime it yeah. requires no evidence right and the reason they haven't charged him is because they have no evidence that would be or at my least guess. that's you know my <laughs> outsider's thoughts yeah. on it. Um, it you know, like, if something does like not require to evidence <laughs> to be listed as an uncharged crime, then okay, just list anything you want. And obviously, you can't file a charge if you have no evidence. But yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what it seems like to me too. Has this affected in a negative way the fundraising that you've been doing? for people to be able to donate to the Free Ross campaign at freeross.org? Well, I think it really has. I mean, and, I, and from comments I've read, uh, you know, uh, I do. And I think that might be part of, I don't know, I mean, this is my, my own idea, but um, if I were wanted to suppress fundraising for someone and if I wanted to smear their reputation so they wouldn't be a hero to some people or whatever, well, that, that would be a pretty good way to do it. I'm not saying they did it or didn't. I don't know. But it has had that effect. Um, I think, I hope that people are realizing because it, that he wasn't indicted uh, in New York for that when they could have. I mean, he was at an arraignment listing indictments um, that it probably does isn't valid. Uh, my speech at Porkfest, I really tried to um, get it across that how it was used and how it is not indicted. And I'm hoping that people will start to realize that. And this is not about a murderer or someone who would casually order anyone's murder. That speech money, that speech from Porkfest is actually available on YouTube already. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric Freerock, who is an activist here in Keene, New Hampshire, he was the one behind all of the filming of the events of Porkfest. So if you missed any of Porkfest or if you missed all of Porkfest... Then Eric Freerock has those videos. I believe it's somewhere near 200 hours of video that he took wow. during the week-long event. He will be going through those videos, getting them uploaded. The first one that he uploaded was yours, Lynn. And I will I be posting the link to that on Facebook and Twitter so that you can see that video. I will use hashtag FreeRoss. That way it makes it easy for anybody trying to find the video. They can just, you know, search for the hashtag free Ross. And speaking about the fundraiser, there was some really good news about mm -hmm. the fundraiser recently where Roger Veer, who is known by some as Bitcoin Jesus, did something on Twitter and it's one of the things to where whenever I see something that says this person will donate this amount of money if you retweet this or if you post this link on Facebook, I'm always skeptical. And I actually didn't even know that this was going around until after it had happened. And I saw a news headline that said Bitcoin Jesus donates or raises over $150,000 for Ross Ulbrich using Twitter refeeds or retweets. So yeah. uh, do you know how much he wound up actually pledging to donate to the Ross Ulbrich defense fund? 
You know, I don't know an exact number. I um, really, I mean, I, I know what everybody else knows what they're reading, but um, I think there was about 16,000 retweets, which is so great. I mean, what a great show of support for Ross. And Roger, oh my gosh, what a hero. I mean, he is so, and you know, it's so creative. Instead of just, oh, I'll write you a check or something, or of course it would be Bitcoin, um, you know, he made such a creative, innovative way of supporting us and so appreciate what he's done. I mean, it's just, oh my gosh, I, I, it, you know, it's enabled us to catch up quite a bit on our legal bills and we haven't received it yet, but we will. So, you know, it takes a while to get this kind of money together. But um, it was, yeah. I think about my my math might be off but i think it was about nine ten months ago it was november of last year when roger veer made at the time the largest bitcoin donation ever when he donated one million dollars worth of bitcoin and i just pulled up the article it was to fee which is the foundation for economic education and at the time, it was 1,000 Bitcoin was the amount that he made as the donation. And that was when Bitcoins were right around $1,000 a piece. So it wound up being a million-dollar donation to Fee. So I know that Roger has done these sorts of donations in the past. And, you know, I've never met Roger Veer but I know people who have, and from what I have heard about him, he definitely is a man of his word. So you should be seeing those Bitcoin fairly soon. I believe, based on a number that I saw, it's going to be somewhere around 260 Bitcoin that he will be donating. So for your sake and for Ross's I hope that you have a secure Bitcoin wallet that you are using we'll be back <laughs> in just a moment with Lynn Albrick on Peace Love Liberty Radio back to Peace, Love, Liberty Radio online at fppradio.com. Lynn Ulbrich is my guest. And, you know, the hour, the hour just flies by. We're in the final segment. And, Lynn, I had mentioned about making sure that, or at least I, I want to make sure that you have a secure Bitcoin wallet that the Bitcoins are being donated to because I'm not sure if you heard about Davi Barker, who he actually winds up selling, he sells pins. He mm -hmm. runs a website called shinybadges.com. And one of the pins that he sells is a pen designed after the Silk Road logo, and he's got it set up to where a portion of the proceeds from the sale of that pen goes to the Ross Ulbrich Defense Fund. And after Porkfest, the wallet that Davi was using during Porkfest, which is not his primary wallet, it's one that he uses when he travels so that he can print up the QR code and people can send money, the wallet that he was using was attached in some way to his gmail account someone was able to hack into his gmail get access to the bitcoin wallet and then cleared out i believe it was just a little over eight bitcoins from his oh, wallet no. that's horrible and this is the second person in two consecutive years that I have known who has had a Bitcoin wallet cleared out right after Porkfest. Oh, really? So well, I, I I hope that you have this in something other than a wallet that is in any way tied to an email address that you use regularly that someone might want to target. Because I, I would hate to see the money that you have been raising 
get taken away by someone who you know means ill towards you towards ross or just towards the bitcoin community as a whole yeah thank you for that and i'll i'll make sure about that thank you oh you're welcome and uh i i know that you have done some limited traveling across the country you happen to have been down in austin texas when the uh texas bitcoin conference was going on and then the south by southwest was happening about the same time so you visited those two venues and you also came up to pork fest the porcupine freedom festival and you had you know previously mentioned that you gave a speech there and i've actually found a link to that speech and i am in the process of getting that posted right now to facebook and twitter the facebook page being facebook.com slash peace love liberty radio and the twitter being my personal twitter which is at daryl w perry so just talk a little bit about the traveling that you've done and some of the amazing people that you have met Well, um, I really haven't, like I was saying, I haven't done that much traveling. Um, I am from Austin and that came up and um, I had a credit on United. I can't, I I don't have a lot of money to spend traveling around, unfortunately. But anyway, I did go to that and stayed with friends and basically just went around um, networking at South by Southwest and uh, the Bitcoin conference people were nice enough to let me come there. And I met wonderful people. And in fact, that led to um, me meeting the guys at Brave New Books, who then suggested I maybe go to Pork Fest to hand out flyers and things like that. But when I contacted them, they said, "Hey, you want to speak?" So I'm like, "Well, okay." <laughs> so um, and it was a great experience. It really was. Um, in in both cases, Pork Fest is an amazing event. It's just so great to be around um, people who are thinking about such big, important subjects and have such. Um, a great reverence for freedom and um, it's it, it was just very refreshing uh, I may have to move to New Hampshire except you know I've got to get Ross out first <laughs> um, but anyway um, no I've met some some great people through this in fact uh, I, I've told Ross all about it and of course he's so encouraged and he said well so mom are you meeting interesting people I said yeah I'm meeting interesting people for sure <laughs> people I never would have met before um, but my main message, really, I'm trying to get it beyond, oh, I'm his mother, I love him, please help me. Because, you know, I understand that just goes so far. And I, But really, I, I think what people need to understand is this is a precedent-setting case. And I'm not the one saying that. Lawyers and uh, all kinds of people recognize that this is a precedent-setting case that will impact the Internet and um, Bitcoin for sure. And there's going to be decisions made and laws made through this case that um, we'll be living with. And so it's very important. And uh, we will all be uh, experiencing the ramifications of it one way or the other. And I'm trying to convey that um, so that people realize that it really affects, it's about their own future, not just my personal future. So aside from donating, because obviously, you know, Ross needs money to be able to pay the lawyers, what are things that some of my listeners could do to help you to help Ross? Well, you know, you know, there's so many smart people out there and um, I am pretty new at a lot of this and, you know, any kind of information, um, contacts, uh, networking, um, that kind of thing. Also, of course, sharing my speech, um, our website, tweeting, following on Twitter, that kind of thing that gets, and maybe doing a poster and posting that and just using the internet to get the word out. You know, if we have a lot of people supporting this, we don't need, each person doesn't have to do a lot. And um, so that's really what I'm trying to do is, is get a real, um, ground grass work, grassroots movement going that doesn't put a big burden on any one person. Can people send Ross mail? Yeah, there on our contact us um, on our website. There is his physical address, and they can ma- uh, send a letter to him. And I, sure I know that jails have, and I, I'm fairly certain he's probably in a prison. 
uh, there are restrictions on what can be sent. So do you know offhand if there are specific things that cannot be sent? Uh, For instance, I publish a newspaper every month. If I wanted to send Ross a copy of the newspaper, do you think that that is something that would be permitted? I do think that would be permitted, yes, because I know they get publications in there. Um, you can, uh, they can get books sent directly from a publisher like Amazon. I mean, a publisher, but distributor like Amazon. Not, you can't just send a book, but he, and he's got tons of books, which is great. Um, but I can't send him cookies <laughs> or, um, you know, anything else, really. Obviously. Uh, and I, I'm glad you mentioned books because I am a publisher and hmm. I recently okay. started a website called books2jail.com where nice. people can buy books with Bitcoin, and I will then send the books to any inmate anywhere in the world. Obviously, you know, specifically within the U.S., but if somebody you know, wanted to send a book to an inmate in Canada, I would do it. I'm not sure what the rules are there. I'm guessing it's similar, that it would have to come from a publisher, and of course I can do that. So if you are interested in sending some books to Ross, but you don't know how to do that. You can just go to books to dot com. And I found the address. You do have it listed on the contact us page of freeross dot org. And is the inmate number I noticed you've got the inmate number in the contact. Is that required for mail to get to Ross? Absolutely. Yeah. You won't get it without that. Okay. That that just seems so strange because <laughs> I know the the local jail here in Keene, New Hampshire you don't have to put an inmate number. You can put somebody's name. And I have actually sent stuff. We jokingly refer to the Cheshire County House of Corrections here in Keene, New Hampshire, as the Keene Spiritual Retreat. <laughs> so I've sent mail addressed to one of my friends that was in jail. And instead of put putting care of uh, Cheshire County House of Corrections, I put care of the Keene Spiritual Retreat. And he still wound up getting the mail. So, you know, I'm guessing, you know, with a federal offense, the rules are definitely going to be a lot stricter than just a county facility in rural New Hampshire. Lynn, thank you so much for coming on the show. We are almost out of time. We've got about 30 seconds left, but I just want to once again stress freeross.org. That's where you can go to learn more about Ross. You can donate. There's all kinds of tap. Who is Ross? Testimonials, photo albums. You can download posters. And I'm sure that Lynn would love it if you make your own. Spread them around. Help raise awareness. And again, Lynn, thank you so much. Thank you, Daryl. Really, really thank you very much.